three Braves legends pass away. Henry Aaron, Phil Necro, and Don Sutton. Yeah, Don Sutton. I'm going to tell you about it. I'm Marky e. Bilson. Yeah, Don Sutton, a lot of people maybe not know this if they don't listen to Atlanta Braves games on the radio, but for years, Don Sutton, who was a native of Alabama, actually called Atlanta Braves games on the very far-ranging Atlanta Braves radio network, and he was a very good color commentator for the Braves. Very interesting to listen to. I uh, didn't like the DH. I liked that. I got to hear a lot of Don Sutton when I was a board operator for Atlanta Braves games in 2017. But before we get to uh, Don Sutton, I want to go to the first person of that trio, that legendary Braves trio who passed away this offseason. That would be Phil Necro. Uh, Phil Necro is probably the greatest knuckleball pitcher who ever lived with more than 300 victories. You know, in 1979, he went 21-20. and 20. Now think about that for a second. Unless things really change in baseball, nobody's going to go 21 and 20 ever again. And it was kind of interesting because he was a pitcher who would go out and complete just about every start he made for manager Bobby Cox. Later on in Bobby Cox's managerial career with the Braves, and I had a, a stint with the Toronto Blue Jays uh, for a while, but then he came back to manage the Braves in 1990 after serving as their general manager uh, for a period of time. At one point, he was both the general manager and field manager in 1990, Bobby Cox. But getting to the point, in the 21st century, Late in Cox's career, there was actually a season where the Braves had only one complete game. And you compare that to a Phil Necro who was asked every time he went out to pitch and uh, got, you know, 21 and 20, you're starting a quarter of the ball games in a season for the 1979 Atlanta Braves when you are pushing 40. Think about that for a second. And that was Phil Necro. He was a guy that even in five-man rotations, you could give the ball to every third day if you needed to. One of the reasons why was the knuckleball, and it kept him into the big leagues until he was 48. He was called by Ed Whitson in an interview I had with the former uh, Pirates and Braves and Yankees pitcher. Excuse me, I said Braves. Whitson did not pitch for the Braves. He pitched for the Padres, the Pirates, the Giants, the Indians, and the Yankees. But uh, there was a period of time in the 80s where both Whitson and Necro were on the Yankees. And Necro was pitching towards the end of his career. He actually got his 3,000th strikeout as a member of the New York Yankees. Do not ask me what the Atlanta Braves were thinking when they let him go. And the Yankees, who had a competitive team, picked him up, put him in their rotation. They were in a pennant race with Phil Necro. Uh, you know, he won 16 games, for instance, in 1985, 16 and 12, the 409 ERA. Uh, at I think he was, by that time, 44 years old. I mean, think about that for a second. That was what the knuckleball could do for you. But he was called the nicest man in baseball by Ed Whitson, who at the time was really under fire in New York. He wasn't getting along with Billy Martin. Uh, the fans didn't necessarily like uh, this country boy from Irwin, Tennessee. When, I mean, you couldn't get in the Eastern time zone two different American cultures than East Tennessee's Irwin, Tennessee, and New York City. You just couldn't. But So it was a tough time for him. And it was kind of interesting that Necro would be that other guy other than Willie Stargell that Whitson would say, nicest guy I ever was with in baseball. Remember when Whitson was a rookie with the Pirates in the late 70s, you know, here was Willie Stargell, the greatest team captain there ever was, the patriarch of the team. And he had a way of taking in the young ball players and treating them initially, uh, hey, you're part of the team and, you know, welcome to the big leagues and all this. He was very good with young players. And, uh, you know, to compare Willie Stargell and, and Phil Necro for their personalities and their engaging and inclusive personalities speaks well of both men. But uh, also, I, I would point out that I've been a sports writer for the Wheeling Intelligencer. Uh, the Ohio Valley Athletic Conference is what they call the high schools and the Wheeling area, you know, going over into the border and the Ohio, into Ohio and such, you know, the northern panhandle of West Virginia. And in the OVAC, it is legend 
of the time were pitching for the Bridgeport Bulldogs, Phil Necro actually went up against Bill Mazeroski in a game back in the 50s. This is OVAC legend, and the way I have heard the story, I, I haven't been able to read the game story in the paper or something, but Mazeroski beat uh, Necro. That's the way I heard it. I, you know, Anyhow, Mazeroski was from Wheeling, West Virginia. I'm assuming he pitched for Wheeling Park. Well, it wouldn't be Wheeling Park then. It would be Wheeling High School, the Wildcats. Okay, it's been Wheeling Park since 1976. Like I said, I used to be a sports writer there. But Bridgeport is still up and going. I used to cover Bridgeport games, uh, go to their gym, be it basketball, be it baseball or, or volleyball, that sort of thing. And uh, really had still an impact. Uh, people were very proud in Bridgeport, Ohio, that that was the hometown of the Necros. Uh, you you would hear them talk about it, even though, you know, when I was writing for the Intelligencer, he'd been out of baseball for 20 years. But that was still something in a tremendous pride there. Uh, the fun thing about Necro also was that late in his career, he pitched for the Cleveland Indians and got the Indians into the pennant race in 86. The Indians never were in the pennant race back then, but with Necro in the rotation and teaching Tom Candiotti how to throw the knuckleball, the Indians really surprised that year, had a winning record, finished uh, third place and such. Uh, but it was fun because they said that Necro's favorite team was from Bridgeport, Ohio, growing up, was the Cleveland Indians. And I you know, remember that a lot as well. Uh, something else I remember about Necro... Uh, and his career started with the Milwaukee Braves towards the end of their run in Wisconsin and such. But uh, he actually pitched game one of the 1982 National League Championship Series against the eventual world champion Cardinals. And I mentioned this because that game then wasn't game one. It got rained out before it could be an official game. And the Braves were leading one to nothing when the game got rained out in the fifth inning. It was very controversial at the time. And as a result, the Cardinals, who had a deeper pitching staff, you know, the game gets thrown off the books. Uh, the, the Braves lose game one in somewhat lopsided fashion to the Cardinals. They bring Necro back, who pitches a competitive game, and the Cardinals win it in the bottom of the ninth off of Gene Garber, and that basically was the series. It was best of five in 1982, and then it returned to Atlanta, and the Braves uh, lost 6-2 to the Cardinals in game three and all this. But what if that game hadn't been rained out? What if Necro was able not only to beat the Cardinals there, but even if they were down 2-1, let's say, pitch a fourth game, could he have beaten the Cardinals again? Could the Braves have made the World Series in 1982, but for rain? Necro was 17-4 and four in that season. Uh, you know, you, you do start to wonder those things uh, when, you, when you know that. But I think that uh, Nuxi was certainly the greatest uh, knuckleballer in the history of baseball, in my opinion, and uh, just, you know, so many memories. Here's here's something to go with you. He was a teammate of both Warren Spahn and Tom Glavin. Think about that for a second. Yeah, because the Braves in 1987 brought him back for one last game. One last game. Uh, he had... He had been traded to the Toronto Blue Jays from the Indians. He did not pitch well for the Blue Jays. They released him after four or five games. So the Braves weren't going anywhere to said, let's pick up our, you know, greatest pitcher of the Atlanta era and give him one last game. And it was kind of a big thing. He actually started the week. There were no football games in September. There was a football strike. There were no football games. And I remember Braves had a five nothing lead and Nuxie was their only pitcher and in the, I think it was the fourth inning, it could have been the third, he ran into a little trouble. The Braves were up 5 nothing, and uh, he gave up two runs, and the bases were loaded, and Chuck Tanner came out and said, you know what, no way I'm letting you lose your last Major League game. This will be it. Comes out, tips the cap, you know, everything's good, except the fact that the bullpen then gave up 15 runs. He left 5-2. Bullpen, yeah, 87 Braves when they traded away all their pitchers for, uh, for you know, Alexander and Garber and everybody they could down this. They had nobody. They had nobody out there. So anyway, but Phil Nut and Necro, and I think that's the thing to remember, the nicest man in baseball, uh, along with Willie Stargell, that's what uh, Ed Whitson used to say. 
Uh, the second legend to pass away, Don Sutton, who you'll remember more as a Dodgers pitcher, don't get me wrong, and was the first pitcher, by the way, in big league history to strike out 100 or more hitters in 20 straight seasons. I'll bet you didn't know that. So there was some controversy about Sutton uh, going to the Hall of Fame because he was always kind of the number two starter, not necessarily the number one. But here's the thing. He was a damn fine number two starter. It wasn't as few. Never a number one. Uh, he was a 20-game winner in 1976. And I remember that because then he was said he was the fastest gun in the West on an episode of, of, of Wonderbug. And the reason why I'm kind of in coat and tie is I remember meeting Don Sutton once, and it was in the press box at PNC Park. Like I said, he was Braves announcer. He loved going to Pittsburgh. He loved the history. He would talk about it on the broadcast all the time. Loved going to Pittsburgh, researching baseball history in Pittsburgh and the history of the Pirates. Kind of a surprising for a native Alabaman who, you know, pitched for the Dodgers as well as the Milwaukee Brewers and the Houston Astros and such. But, no, he uh, was a 300-game winner and always said such nice things about um, the city of Pittsburgh when he was broadcasting the games and all this. And so for a guy from Pittsburgh, I always loved Don Sutton. But what about the story of the press box? Yes, it's uh, Don Sutton. And Don Sutton actually sees me. I think I'm going to go get a pop or something like that in the press box at PNC Park. And he sees me in the hallway there and he goes, hey, there's the best dressed guy in the press box. Because I, I used to sort of pride myself. I'm going to wear a coat and tie, you know, act like I ought to be there uh, when I was in the press box. And he, and he said, that, and I really appreciated that uh, from Don Sutton. And I said, Don Sutton, I know I've got to ask you this. I My name is Marky Bilson. And here's what I get. I am a big fan of car TV shows. Duke's Hazard is my favorite. Tell me about the story of you appearing on Wonderbug. Now, if you have any idea what Wonderbug was, that was my favorite uh, skit on the old Croft Superstars kids TV show. Used to watch it on Saturday morning. That's sitting in a junkyard waiting to be ground up as a pile of cars. <laughs> you know, here's a funny schlep car. Let's make him ours. With a magic horn, the new car was born. The toughest of the toughest supercars. Anyway, all right. I'm not going to sing that anymore. But yes, there was uh, a show uh, where one of the actors actually wound up making porno movies. <sighs> Wholesome environment there, but not with Don Sutton. And uh, no, he remembered everything about that episode. He remembered the Little League field it was broadcast on or where they taped it on. He remembered everything about I, I was amazed. It is like steel trap memory of everything surrounding his guest appearance on Wonderbug way back 1976, 1977. And uh, I yeah, what can I tell you? I mean, you've got to love someone like that. Uh, also, being a kid from Pittsburgh and the, I mentioned Willie Stargell, who Ed Whitson said was the nicest man, along with uh, Phil Necro, high company there. Sutton, great pitcher. Like I said, a consistent pitcher. You knew you were going to get a quality start every time you got. Uh, he went out on the bump. Uh, I remember him not so much with the Dodgers in his prime, although I do remember his last season with the Dodgers in 88. Uh, and he always said, I think I played one year too long and all this. Uh, he wasn't with the team by the time the World Series ran around and all this. But he was key contributor to uh, a Houston Astros playoff team in 1981. Uh surprisingly playing against the Dodgers in the playoffs that year. And he was also a key contributor to the Milwaukee Brewers in 82 uh, when they won their only pennant and played the aforementioned St. Louis Cardinals in the 82 World Series. But I get, you know, I'm going to like Sutton because Sutton actually gave up seven home runs to Willie Stargell. That was the most that any pitcher gave up to pop. So I, I really like him and all this. And I guess, to, yeah, to me, Willie Stargell is baseball and in his, uh, eh, you might call it his career year, but his best season for homers, Stargell, he hit 48, which was more than the runner-up that year, Hank Aaron, uh, who hit 47 in 1971. 
And Henry Aaron's career high for home runs was 47 and 71. Stargell beat him by one in Aaron's career high year. Now, that should tell you something there. But we're talking about Braves thing. And, uh, well, if you really want to know, uh, Stargell was a Braves coach from 86 to 88. But uh, I let, let's talk a little bit about uh, Henry Aaron. Uh, what can you say about 755 that hasn't been said now in the time since his passing? But I'll just say this. Why is there not more consideration for Henry Aaron as greatest baseball player of all time? He's got the record for most RBIs and, you know, a consistent 300 hitter, five tool player, uh, the all time home run champion for how long until Barry Bonds came along. And, you know, so many people still consider Aaron as the great home run champion. He once said that uh, Milwaukee was where the best fans in baseball were. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, but, of course, he came back to play for the Brewers for two years. And, I, you know, one thing that I later found out was as a young, bad baseball player, as a teenager, going to Shippensburg University baseball camp where Ike Brookins, who was the brother of Tom Brookins, if you remember the old Tigers third baseman. Anyway, Ike Brookins was also a Tigers pitcher in 1975. And I noted in the records, I found out that Brookins uh, struck out Hank Aaron. Now, Ike Brookins was one of our instructors in baseball camp. And I just thought I was learning baseball from a pitcher who struck out Henry Aaron. I only met Aaron once as a book signing. I mean, thank you. Thank you. You know, that was all it was and all this. But just what an impact he had. We're hearing a lot of uh, stories about the racism that he endured when he was chasing Babe Ruth's record. And remember, he sat in the off season at 713 when the record was 714. So he had a whole off season to get the hate mail and all this, but he did also, and I think this has never really been said. This was marked in uh, Lonnie Wheeler's book um, with Henry Aaron, which was one of the life stories that uh, I, if I had a hammer, uh, I had a hammer was the name of the book. And uh, it was written around 1990 and it was Aaron's uh, autobiography with Lonnie Wheeler was the other writer. Uh, but it mentioned that, you know, there were tremendous amounts of people who were rooting for Henry Aaron to break the record and even uh, said, we're naming our baby Aaron because of the style and grace that you're displaying at this time. Those are stories that really need to be said that haven't necessarily been said about Henry Aaron and the impact he had. I know just as a little leaguer, you know, going out for the team in 1980, 1981, Aaron's last year was 1976, but you could still buy, and they were quite prevalent, you know, baseball gloves with Henry Aaron's uh, face and home run king. Now, how that contributed to defense and baseball gloves, I'm not quite sure, but uh, no, it was, that was the iconic nature of Henry Aaron. Uh, I took my cousin Daniela once to a baseball game. She always wanted to go to a Baltimore Orioles game. So I took her to a Baltimore Orioles game once with one of her friends. And we made a comment. This would have been around 2002, 2003. And just a, of Henry Aaron. And my cousin, she always wanted to go to an Orioles game, but she did not. She wasn't a baseball fan. She did not know who Henry Aaron was. And her friend, who was you know, an Orioles fan and myself, we just sort of looked at, how could you live on this earth for as long as you have and not know who Hammer and Hank Aaron is? Uh, you get a little bit about his star power in the old movie Bad News Bears, you know, and what uh, that was like. But all these years later, I mean, I, even when I covered the Mets for New York Metro in 2009 in spring training, I remember uh, they had a road game in Orlando against the Braves. Uh, where the complex, uh, the spring training complex for the Atlanta Braves was, and they were playing, you know, move over, babe, here comes Henry, uh, outside the ballpark, just like the Mets at Port St. Lucie would play, you know, meet the Mets all the time. And that really said something. This was 2009, you know, and it was last year, Aaron with the Braves was 74. So that's sort of what an iconic figure. He's going to be a guy that, you know, you'll always remember, uh, and really should get more credit as greatest baseball player of all time. You hear Babe Ruth, you hear Willie Mays, you rarely hear Aaron on that level 
and he deserves consideration, if not being named greatest player of all time, in my opinion. So it's been a sad off season with these three Braves legends. And yes, although Sutton, probably more associated with the Dodgers than anybody else, is a Braves legend for his sports casting, which was very good for the Atlanta Braves. And I was, I was really, yeah, I was shocked when I heard that he had passed away. And I was looking forward to listening to him on ball games this next uh, season on the radio. And so I was deeply saddened. It's a sad time and always tough when people uh, pass on. But all I can tell you is that the names Sutton, Necro, and Aaron are going to be remembered as long as baseball is popular. I'm Marky Bilson. I ask that you follow me on either Rumble or YouTube, whatever you may be watching this on. Uh, also, I've got Twitter, Bilson Marky. You can follow me there. And, of course, my Medium page. Until next time, I'm Marky Bilson.